Welcome to Croydon SCA Church. We are excited that you have chosen to worship with us online today. We are a church driven by Jesus' mission, a mission to save, transform and restore lives. We want you to know that you are valued. So stay with us, participate and be blessed. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and visit our website www.croydonadventist.org Sweet, sweet by and by, we shall 
what a joy and an honor to be with you again another Sabbath morning. Welcome to Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church, our Sabbath school review, lesson study review, or as we call it, our Bible study hour. It is a joy to have you. Thank you for joining us so much. Uh, whether you're on YouTube or you're on live stream or you're on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or wherever you're joining us from, it is great to have you. We've come, sadly, to the final lesson in this quarter's study, and what a lesson it is. The memory verse is from Psalm 27, 14. Here's what it says. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord! Exclamation mark. But is waiting always easy? How do you wait when the going gets tough and God doesn't seem to be going through? Why does God always seem to be in the business of waiting? Uh, many Bible legends had to wait. What's the purpose of waiting? We're going to get into all of those questions. We have a wonderful panel here. Text somebody, remind them that Croydon Bible Study is on. We might even be on uh, Adventist Radio London, I'm sure. We're going to get started with our co-host, Sister Rose. She'll lead us off in prayer. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Let us pray. Kind, loving, and gracious Father, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. We thank you, dear Lord, that in the waiting, you are there. Mm. In the hoping, you are there. Let us learn this and more in today's lesson. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Rose. It is great to have Sister Rose uh, with us again. Uh, the panel this morning is all Croydon Seventh-day Adventist uh, Church folks. Yes, who we have this morning. Well, you would not believe, but he is here. He is one of our panelists. He has switched chairs. Good morning, Elder Johnny. How are you this morning? Good morning, one and all. I am fine, nervous, sitting in this chair at the moment, <laughs> wondering what on earth is the host going to ask me? But you know we're together here studying God's Word. It's great to be here. This Praise the morning. Lord. We have another panelist also joining us, um, who is also someone who sits in this chair from time to time. Elder David Billet, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. God has truly allowed the Sabbath to be wonderful, and it's a, indeed a pleasure to, to, to really be sitting this end and uh, engaging with you. So God bless, and I pray that we have a wonderful time Wonderful this stuff. It's great to have Elder David Billet with us. And uh, we also have returning one of our young leaders here in Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church, Sister Diane. How are you this morning? Good morning. I'm very happy and blessed to be here, and I'm excited for this study. Great happy stuff. Time. Fantastic. Thank you. Sister Rose, have our friends began to say where they're watching us from? Um, maybe we can just say hello to a few of our friends, regular returnees, and um, see where we're being joined from this morning. Yes, we have all of our regulars coming, and I would like to just say hello to you all coming from Ghana, Kenya, Barbados, mm. Guyana, the U.S., Jamaica, and right here in sunny U.K., Thank right. you all, and have a blessed day. Indeed. It's a beautiful morning this morning. It's 11 degrees Celsius outside. Not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, but it is, um, it's a great day. Uh, let's get started with the lesson. We have um, it's three minutes past 10 here. It's an interesting lesson that we studied this week. And so, um, as usual, I want your participation. We're going to do a review of the other lessons that we have covered so far. Later on down, we will get to that. Oh, by the way, we have a regular class person. Sister Jackie, who I will trouble, sorry, who I will greet um, very, very shortly. Um, by the way, let me just say good morning. Sister Jackie, how are you today? How was your week? Elder Neil, I am blessed and highly favoured and so, so thankful to be in Sabbath School yeah. this week as I was absent last week. It's great to have you. And before I go any further, I have breaking news that Mother Saul has joined us very early. Mother Saul, good morning to you. How are you this week? Thank the Lord for his goodness. He is good. All right, great. Uh, Mother Saul is short and to the point, as she always is. Um, here's your question at home. How does one wait on the Lord? That's your question at home. And what are some of the things that you are waiting for? How does one wait on the Lord? <laughs> And what are some of the things that you are waiting for? Basically, I'm asking, 
what does it mean to wait on the Lord? And how do you actually go about waiting on the Lord? And as I said, the lesson is, is, re is replete with, with um, all areas of waiting. Let's go over firstly, though, to understand what the lesson means when it says waiting or the Bible means. Elder Johnny, let's start with you first. Give us a biblical definition, if you will, of waiting and, and what that entails. Okay, before I give you the biblical definition, let's let's take the, the Cambridge Online Dictionary definition, summarizing, um, allowing time to go by until someone comes or, or, or something you are expecting to happen will happen, mm. or until you can do something, all right? So there's a, a focus on an object of some sort when you're talking about waiting. From a biblical point of view, um, waiting is synonymous with the word hope mm. because it, it's not an open-ended wait of idleness. It's where there is this, this thing that you are looking for. You know, whether when, when you think, I suppose, of somebody who may be climbing a mountain and it's hard, but they're, as they're, they're seeing the top, it's going to keep them going. There was a lady on the news, I think she was in Scotland, that done some ultra marathon something or another. Um, but basically she was doing a lot of running for a lot of days and she was really tired, but seeing the finishing line in, in, in position. Mm. And this is this thing. So the, the, the lesson, I, I'm no Hebrew specialist, but it used the word kawa, I don't even know how you pronounce it, Q-A-W-A-H, which is this... It was either an instruction from God or dependence on God that was coming out. And hope is the thing that keeps us going. And Psalm 39, verse 7, And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Diane, thank you so much, Elder Johnny, for what you, what you uh, expressed there. We're going to go over to Sister Diane now. Uh, Diane, tell us a little bit more about what does waiting entail? Just a reminder of your question at home. Your question at home is, how does one wait on the Lord? And what are some of the things that you are waiting for? Um, it's always important to know how to do things. So keep your thoughts coming in. Um, I, I just noticed that somebody's even joining us from Haiti, and that is absolutely wonderful. Diane, tell us some more about what waiting entails. Thank you, Elder Neil. Um, so just looking at the lesson, the lesson points out that waiting also entails perseverance. Um, and just the internet research on the definition of perseverance, that's divine defined as, sorry, the persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in, in achieving success. So you can look at that as that, that continued steadfast hope, that, mm -hmm. that trust, that faith. Um, as the memory verse says, um, mm -hmm. wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, um, through God, through Christ, we can contemplate on the goodness of God in the past as we wait. Um, and we can see God in the present and also in the future. And furthermore, um, it's our perspective on the waiting um, and the fact that it, it is a blessing for us to wait as we are invited to rest um, in God as per Psalm verses 37, verse 7. Mm -hmm. um, and I can quickly read that. Yeah, Psalm 37, th uh, verse 7. Let's jump to that. Yes, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not, yes. fret not thyself because of him, sorry, who prospereth in the way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. So it's that um, mm. coming to God through his, his invitation for us to. Um, and also along with that, uh, we have uh, the fruit of the spirit, right? It's produced that patience mm. um, and that faith. Um, and, and that's God really building that Christ-like character that he wants with us. So to wait is really a blessing. Right. So to summarize, you're saying there's perseverance involved. There is resting involved at Psalm 37, 7. Rest in the Lord. We're going to come back to that and exercise that thought a little bit more. I see your points coming in at home. Uh, let's take a few of them, Sister Rose. What are our friends saying so far? Okay. I'm <clears throat> sorry. Over in live stream, Alana says, I wait on the Lord by learning patience. I, in, in my reality, I've set goals and aspirations, but I don't have what it takes to achieve them. 
so I ask it from God. So, in the meantime, I have to be still and trust in the Lord to reveal what his will is. I also wait for the return of the Lord to see my loved ones who are at rest. That is my hope. And over in um, TikTok, Jessica says, they say expectation hurts, mm. but hoping in God means us expecting his results. Mm. Please help me understand. Okay, let's hope we can do that by the end of the, the session. Thank you so much. That is it at the moment. That is it at the moment. Uh, okay. Keep your, your views on YouTube coming in. I know we had a network outage a while ago, and we're going to apologize to you for that. Um, please forgive us for that. Live stream might still have a few issues there, and our, ne our, our um, tech folks are working very hard to bring everything back up. So we're going to read your views on YouTube in just a moment. Elder David, thank you so much for being here. But Elder, um, you know how we always have lots of interesting conversations, you and I. I hear what Johnny says about waiting and hoping. I, I hear about the perseverance that Sister Diane talks about. The lesson even says waiting is not idle time. It's a time full of faith and trust revealed in work and action. It strengthens our hope. It motivates us to work harder. Elder Billet, is that a realistic description of waiting? There are some people who are waiting, and frankly, they're tired and frustrated of waiting. Explain. <laughs> Explain. Um, I think the problem is that the, the, um, the frustration of waiting comes on our, from our perspective. Um, how we look at what waiting is. Um, uh, waiting in itself is an, an activity. Um, the problem is, is that we're waiting on God and we believe that uh, God is in control of that waiting time. So we have to just watch and we just have to be faithful and, until God uh, does what he has to do. But the scriptures tells us that we need to occupy mm -hmm. until he comes. Mm -hmm. Um, and in that, we must maintain a relationship with God um, while we're, we're actually abiding um, in his care and his, his love. Because God is not sitting around doing nothing. Um, if we look at Luke 19, um, it basically says that uh, this ruler went away and left some talents for those who were waiting. So God expects us to use those gifts and talents to accomplish so many things while waiting. And one of the things that it does accomplish um, is that um, we have time to think, we have time to develop our mind, mm -hmm. and we have time to actually participate in appreciating and getting the things that we need uh, knowing that God is basically saying, I have given you the ability to do this. Mm. Um, so the waiting process is, um, is not a time where God is in, inactive. In mm. fact, the waiting process is part yeah, of but, the but solution. Elder, I suppose we only have a short time this morning. So I'm going to push us as Seventh-day Adventists now, not to sound so beautiful, but to let's go down in the, let's go down in the gutters, if you will. Elder, have you not been in a spot where... You're tempted to be discouraged. You're tempted to break, but you know God has come through because you've seen him before. How do you maintain your courage and your strength in that time? How do you act? This is, this is why I'm asking you at home. How do you wait? How do you make waiting time exciting time or, or, or profitable time? The waiting time is being in the presence of God all the time. And then when you look beyond... Can you break that down for me? Well, the presence of God for me is to understand and appreciate that he is active. Mm -hmm. He is active. He is constantly doing something. He's constantly engaging. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, during a, a, a challenging time uh, this week, it comes to the end of our financial year and things need to happen. I've had some incredible meetings from a business perspective. Yeah. And I'm expecting God to manifest himself in a way which looks obvious. God is going to do this, and I've shaken hands with all those involved, only to uh, get to another part of the, the country to, uh, to determine that they have not pursued what they promised me. Disappointment comes about. But to my, you know, to my surprise and joy, God has already been w uh, dealing with something else that actually takes the place of that situation 
and even enhances um, the, the, the sort of uh, business which I was engaging. I'm not going to sort of talk business on the Sabbath, sure. but that's the personal relationship. You're saying that you can, you can testify that God is busy while you're waiting. Well, absolutely. And so you yeah. can trust that even though this thing is not working out and you're a bit frustrated, mm -hmm. God is behind the scenes doing something. Always working on right. my behalf. Fantastic. Let's mm -hmm. hear what you've been saying. We had some network outage on YouTube. I believe we're back. Sister Rose, what are our friends saying now? Yes, we are now back. And so Joan is saying, waiting in prayer and praise for God's second coming. Um, Faith of the Faithful Ministry says, I'm waiting to be reunited with my family here, mm. and she's there in Canada. Anthony Bromley says, Bromley says, when we wait on the Lord, we understand that God's timing is right timing for my life and all things by extension. I wait on God for his signal to go forward. I wait for the Spirit's time signal. Mm. And Mildred says, waiting on the Lord is like trusting in the Lord. And I wait by spending time waiting in prayer and studying his word. Maxine says, waiting for Jesus to return to take us home. And Rodney Smith, we wait in two ways. We wait for things that we cannot change and we wait with long patience as Christians, not being derailed by adversity. And Lily says, waiting on the Lord means trusting that the Lord will make it happen at the right time. It's trusting that he who promised is faithful and the word is proven true, waiting for God for restoration. And Verdella says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Waiting is completely trusting in the Lord, says Erica. Erlene says, waiting entails expectations. Mm -hmm. I am waiting to see my children and siblings rededicate their lives to God because he promised to bring them back to their borders. Okay. And Rocco says, can I just do two more? Absolutely. Rocco says, we wait for the Lord by surrendering of will. Mm. Letting the Savior change our heart, mind, and character to be refined as Jesus answer our desires for love, of love for him. And Francis says, we wait patiently in prayer. Mm. And one more, Veronica, waiting on the Lord is praying and praising and believing even if his answer is no. All right, that's interesting. Um, Mother Saul. I do yes, see your sir. I see your point, but let me just ch ch um, challenge your son a little bit and then come back to you, okay? And maybe you can help in his defense. Elder Johnny, what is this business that God always have his people waiting? Abraham waited, Daniel waited. There's a lot of waiting in the Bible. What's the spiritual significance of waiting? And the thing is, these stories, these characters, these heroes, if you please, they're, they're stories that are there for our benefit. And that's what we must recognize. We shouldn't just read them and, and, and forget about them. So when we consider, um, as, as we've established, you know, something needs to be happening while you are waiting. Um, when we recall some of these examples, again, I refer to Hebrews 11. You've got your favorites that are in there and each of them are there because they had to have this, this, this supernatural faith, as I like to call it. My, I, I often refer to the three Hebrew boys, not specifically mentioned in Hebrews 11. But again, because they were able to say, even if the Lord mm. is not going to save us, we, we are not going to. Yeah, but, to, but, but Johnny, to my, my, my point is, is, is God trying to do something in us, with us, through us, for us, while we're waiting? What, why doesn't... Why is God not in the business of instant gratification like we are these days? Because the thing is, some things will happen instantly, but it's about building this character, isn't it? Let's, let's take Abraham and Sarah. Now, they decided, you know what? Let's help God. You know, they were, they were waiting so long for, for this promised child. They decided to help God. And we know what happened. But you see, he, he, all right, he was Abraham there, but Abraham, mm. we've got that full story there in Hebrews 11. But I mean, if we just look briefly at Romans 4, I'm just going to read two of the two verses, verses 21 and 22. So again, he's moved from 
Abram who thought he can help God to now Abraham. And it says, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform on verse 22. Mm -hmm. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. This Abraham was not the same Abraham. And it took time for him to be able to get there. And th mm. this is the point, that it's a learning process. The, mm. the, the, the Moses, who was then, you know, the, the, the prince, prince of, of Egypt, Egypt. Yeah. He, he needed that time. He needed that time at, at Laban and going through the desert and whatsoever to be, become the leader of the children of Israel to take them out of Egypt. But my final point, you know, when I think of the early example, earliest in the example in the Bible of waiting, right? Let's take it. Adam and Eve had sinned. They now were told a deliverer was going to come. There may have been excitement when Cain was born, but later to become a murderer. And they were sad because the point is this, this, this promised child that was going to deliver them did not come in Adam's lifetime. And here's the message for us. You see, just as one day, when the second Adam is going to wake the first Adam, mm. and Adam, the first Adam, his waiting is going to be over. And that's the point for us, that there may be a long time of waiting, but let us not give up hope, because one day, we wouldn't have to wait anymore because wow. we are going to get the, the reward that, that God has promised us. All right, thank you, Elder Johnny. Let's hear Mother Saul. Mother Saul, you, your, your thoughts on this? Yes, sir. For me, waiting on the Lord takes all of you as an individual. Oh, wow. In waiting during that time, you have to be giving God sacrifice of praises and thanksgiving. There are certain prayers you have to learn to pray, like Psalm 22, in Psalm 22, when it tells you, you have to love God, you have to fear him, you have to honor him, you have to respect him in every way as we learn to wait upon him. Mm. Also, Hosea 14, 2 mm. gives us some instructions as well when we are waiting. Okay. Indeed, according to the lesson, we are not being idle. We have to be active. Mm. God in his mercy, according to the situation, I don't think he will give us the years that Abraham had <laughs> because in Abraham's life that had to do all with the, 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 the coming Messiah and so on. Everything unfolded there. But we are not waiting for the Messiah that way. Mm. We are waiting for him. Yes, in expectancy for when he comes the second time to be called by him and also to be able to live with him in the earth made new. Okay. What this I'm speaking about is a practical situation. We are practical people. We live practically. God pays attention to those as well. Mm. And okay. he has said that when we call, he hears he sees, he understands our desires and our longings. He has promised not to supply our wants, but our needs, according to his riches in glory. Mother Saul, thank you so much. We have to move on slightly because we are pressed for time this morning. Thank you for that point. Um, let me hear some more from you at home. I don't believe I've been taking enough of your comments. Go ahead, Sister Rose. Okay. Helen says, when I wait on God, I have presented my concerns and needs to him. I now with hope and faith trust in his promise and perfect timing for his guidance and will to be done. Mm. And 
sorry, just coming up to the next one. Um, Veronique says, waiting on the Lord is praying and praising and believing, even if his answer is no. And That's a good point. Sorry, just going to the next one. In a fast-going world, we have to be disciplined to wait upon the Lord. Everything is now. Mm. I am waiting for the Lord to save my family. Oh, wow. That's a great point. Okay, let's, let's move on ever so slightly. Um, the, last, I'm the question I'm going to ask you at home. Verse 2 of Psalm 131 says, I have calmed and quieted my mind, my soul. How do we learn to do that? I found that quite powerful in the lesson this week. So let me repeat that again. Uh, verse 2 of Psalm 131, friends at home, says, I have calmed and quieted my soul. How do we actually learn to do that? That's the question I, we, we've moved on to. The moderator will put that up on the screen for you ever so slightly. I, I see your points coming in, and there are some very powerful points. Diane, why don't I start with you? I'll ask you the audience question. Expand on Psalm 131, verse 2 for us. Um, talking about, I have calmed and quieted my soul. I think that's a very strong and potent line from the psalm. As we wait, the ability to calm and quiet one's mind. Talk to me. Yes, yeah, so Psalm um, verse 131 is, is very powerful, definitely. So it says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as weaned, as a weaned child. Mm. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. So really what comes out uh, for me is that deep dependency um, and that humility. Um, and it's that imagery with the, with the child and the mother. Um, mm. That for the weaned child. child in mm. mother's arms, yeah. Yes. As in, that for the child, the mother is uh, all in all, you know, relying on the mother for that nourishment as, as the child weans um, to, to supply the child with, with everything they need. Um, so, so within that child, it's, it's really innate. And for the same with us as well, you know, we can, pride can come in and, you know, we can say, oh, we don't need God um, when pride comes in. But it's really that acknowledgement um, of the fact that, that we do need God. And we can even go to, to Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6, you know, mm. um, that talks about trust in the Lord um, and, and not to lean on our own understanding, um, but in God's, um, you know, because God in his, his magnitude and his greatness and all that he provides. And, you know, we're but dust. What, what can we do for ourselves, really? And what can we know um, if it wasn't for mm. that spirit of God being within us? So it's um, about reliance. Us, when God, you're saying reliance, it's about yes. learning reliance. Let's see what Elder David has to say. Um, Psalm 131, verse 2. Um, it's the same question that we're all discussing. Uh, Elder Johnny will comment on it in a moment also. And I want you at home to reflect upon that. I have learned, I have calmed and quieted my soul, David, like a weaned child in mother's arms. That is my state of mind. David, how, share with us how we can get into that frame of reference. Well, the imagery of a, a, a weaned uh, child is um, is quite a vivid one, um, in that it is a it, it's a, uh, a situation where the child is transitioning from one situation into uh, another. So I saw it as a way of becoming more independent, um, and as you become more independent in your relationship, because sometimes what tends to happen. If I'm fretting about a situation that I'm waiting for, mm. somebody else then frets because I'm fretting, who then somebody else frets because, and then our prayer system becomes all about fear and fret mm. and pleading and cajoling God as though God is sitting there with his hands folded and wondering if he, you know, just like the, the you know, the gods, Zeus and all of these guys from the, you know, they sit down watching this and playing this, this game, which is to me, um, uh, you know, quite a ridiculous way to, to, to see God. Um, and, and so what I see is a development. We're now eating um, uh, solid food, as, as Paul tells us in Hebrews, that we need to stop drinking the milk. And so we need to spend a little bit more time engaging with God and communicating God, with God as though he is a merciful, loving God. And maybe start asking, the, not stop asking God to help us to do what we want, but start asking God to help us to do what he wants. Yeah. 
Mm. And, and I think that, that will... So, then... so, so that imagery for you is one of faith, is a child who has learned to trust. That's right, to move away from the, the you could say, the umbilical connection mm -hmm. with, the, with the mother and now have an independent relationship with mm. God. Or, or maybe we should say interdependent. So there's well, a, there's yes, a of course, of course. Mm. I mean, I, what comes to mind is Jesus when he was 12 years old mm. and then he disappears and he's still obviously under the, the headship of his family, his mother and father, but he recognizes now that he is weaned from that um, sort mm. of uh, daily engagement to a greater responsibility, and that is the responsibility of actually in, in, in blending himself or allowing God to blend him with herself and entangle himself mm. um, with us. You know, it's a very good point Elder David makes, and the reason I'm sticking with this question is there are quite often times when, we, if we're honest with ourselves as Christians, we're not people who are calm. We're not people who are rested. We're not people who are quiet. Uh, Elder John is going to speak in a moment, but I'm going to take your point from Sister Rose. We're not people who have learned to chillax with God, if you please, and just to be totally at peace with him. Um, it's once for, it, we move from one state of worry and anxiety to the next. So when David speaks this way, or the psalmist speaks this way, I think it's quite potent. Elder, uh, Sister Rose, let's hear what some of our friends at home are saying before we take Elder Johnny's point. Yes, over in live stream, Alana says, because I have sought to have a deeper relationship with God, the noise of the world strangely went dim. I am at a place of peace that surpasses the understanding of those around me. I am not as, I'm sorry, I think the rest hasn't come through as yet. I will mm. read it when it does. Oh, not as easily stirred up as before, yes. thus allowing me to shine in a way that glorifies God. Very good. And over on YouTube, um, I am calm because we have no control but to wait. We get stressed out and sick worrying about things we have no control over. And Veronique, Veronique says, waiting teaches us patience so that we can be calm. Rocco says, by concentrating our being and offering, no, consecrating our being and offering our heart to Jesus at the foot of the cross, and we don't have anything to offer other than our obedience and meditation on the word of God. Shazi says, pray the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Mm. Ang says, be still, meditate on his word, and he will soothe your soul while you wait. And says, learning to trust God. And mm. the next one, Psalms 1312, through contentment and peace in trusting God. And mm. Elaine says, I am content because you have been my Jehovah Jireh. Mm. Let's take one more point and then we go to Elder Saul. Okay. Um, Nigel says, we learn to calm our souls in and wait upon God through developing patience and trust through conflict. Our fast-paced society is at variance with this. But a good point, that is, to, to go to Elder Saul. Do you think, Elder Saul, that waiting in the crucible, you remember that lesson, has a way of teaching us who God is and, 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 and helping us, therefore, to be calm when others about them are losing their heads. You know, the text comes to mind, Elder. It's a long question, sorry. Do not be anxious about anything, Philippians 4, 6. But in every situation, let, let, let prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which passes or transcends all understanding will be yours. Give me your thoughts on, on that. It's interesting that you go back to that lesson in terms of waiting in the crucible, because this is it. There's waiting when, all right, you're comfortable, but you're just waiting. But now, where you are in the heat, where now the pressure is building up on you, then how do you deal with this? And it's all about this learning experience. But I mean, even going back to this concept of the child, moving on slightly maybe from the wean child, um, Matthew 18 verse 3 says um, that unless you are converted and become as little children, you will enter heaven. And this is the thing, this concept of childlike faith. I remember... Tessa, my younger sister, when she was a baby and my older brother Shem, he would be 
you know, playing with her and things like that, he would, hopefully nobody's listening from social services, he would put her, <laughs> let's say, high up. But she would have no fear of jumping down into his arms because she knows he is going to catch her. And this is the thing. Once we have this relationship with God, knowing that he's going to see us through when all else fails, we can still cling and we can still hold on. So when we come to the crucible, let's keep focused on the goal. Let us follow God's leading. It is tough, don't get me wrong, it's tough. But by holding on, it's going to strengthen us and prepare us for what is to come. Okay, that's a very strong point. Um, Sister Rose, let's take two more thoughts from our friends at home before we go to Jackie, who has a point. Thank you. Um, Three Angels Gospel Ministry says, we learn it to foregoing the pleasures of this life and reflecting and doing the things that God commands us by the leading of the Holy Spirit, says Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Mm. And Angela says, humbling yourself in God's presence and be solely dependent on him as a child depends on his mother. And can I just do two more? Please. Um, Marlene says, a quiet soul is one that lives in humble dependence of God. And Mildred says, I am contented with waiting, especially since I see my family coming one by one to God. Mm. I wait by keeping busy in his work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me hear your point, uh, Sister Jackie. Thank you, Sister Rose. Yeah, I just love what both elders have had to say on the wean child and the transition and, and all of that idea. And when I looked at this scripture, 100 and Psalm 131, I, it just made me think of in that waiting space, we need to grow. We mm. cannot remain as we are. And when a child is weaned, it means they're coming from one, as, as um, you know, David said, you know, not drinking the milk anymore. We're going on to solids. Mm. And that, that, that movement means that you're growing. When you're eating solids now, you're, you're, you're growing. You're, you're, you're moving from where you were and getting closer and closer to where you need to be. And so that waiting time, although it may be challenging, although it may be difficult, although it well might be a crucible, we are growing. We are moving higher to mm. where we want to be in, in God's eyes. I Thank believe. you so much. Let's, let's move on ever so slightly. I'm going to ask you this question at home, and we're, we're probably going to bring a wrap to this section of uh, proceedings before we then... Um, move on ever so slightly. Um, what if you wait for years and never get what you wait for? How do you cope with that? Let's be real now. Um, I have had multiple sisters in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, young gentlemen as well, gentlemen in their 50s. Elder Neil, I have been waiting for a spouse for years. And the Lord has not come through. I have been waiting for a better job. I have been waiting for, you know what I mean? Somebody's been praying for their children to come into the church for 40 years. Not happened. The question to you at home, and the same question we're going to answer inside here. What if you wait? For years you're waiting and you don't get what you are hoping for. How do you cope with that? How do you deal with with that. Elder Johnny, why don't we start with you? I mean, it, it, it is a tough one um, in terms of dealing with it. And, and this is the situation that we've just been referring to before, that waiting, um, you need endurance. You need to have hope. You are still going to get discouraged, but it's where your faith really sits. Are, are you the type of person that's going to say, well, you know, the Lord knows best. It could be, using the example of a spouse, it could be the Lord knew that if he gave me a spouse that things could have happened. And maybe I might be in prison now or something like that. By the way, I'm happily married, <laughs> just using that as an example. Um, mm. But you, you understand that it, it's recognizing, well, the Lord knows best. But that comes with time. 
You know, it's easy to say, look, just, just, just trust the Lord. But regardless of your situation, if, if, it, if it's the work, the job that you're in now, just be, be that witness and do the best in your work. Mm. If it's in your singleness, you be that witness for the Lord. Mm. So, so and, your, your, and, your and, situation, and your answer, Johnny, is that no matter what you're going through, how long, just say... God understands. God knows why I have not. Is, is that what you're saying? Just, just, just it's more than just just, just say, leave it up to well, you know. It's more than just saying that. It, it, it's being good, you know, in in your singleness, you know. Well, it, let's it, let's it, not use singleness, but <laughs> you know, you're, you're waiting. I was using the examples you gave me. Yeah. Whatever your waiting is, it's it's occupying the time, and th and this is the thing, and it's it's looking right. to try and help others and not pitying yourself. Okay. All right. I hear you. Mother Saul. Yes, sir. Are you still there? Are you with us or against us? Can you please speak up a bit? Can you please All speak right. up? And... Apparently, Mother Saul isn't hearing me too clearly. Mother Saul, how do you not allow the waiting period to break you when you have been waiting so long and God doesn't seem to be coming through? See, if God has given you his word... You know that God will not lie. He does not lie. And Christ says through his word to you that whatever the Father says, it will happen and he will do it. God has promised that he will give us added grace. Whatever situation we have to face, he will give us added grace. What God grace does for us. God's grace draws closer to him. His grace does not only sanctify us, but his grace makes us strong mm. because his strength will become our strength. And as I said before, we cannot just sit and wait. We have to know the words to use to God. We have to know the praises and thanksgiving we must give to him constantly. And when the evil one will be trying to put webs around us and to tell us, tell us things to dishearten us, we call on the name of Jesus and we ask him for his help. Because he is the one. Christ says he will work through his son. Mm. And if that is so, and we believe his word, yes. it helps us. For instance, now God might think you need to have a bit more patience. And so in this waiting time, he would help you to come to the place to do that. Okay. You see, this lesson, yes, uh, that we are doing, all these lessons, because of time, we have to rush it through. But the practical, the practical solution within ourselves is us and God individually. When we have to work with him, then we have a story to tell. He says, when I have done so, then you tell it. You glorify my name. You have to tell persons what he has done for you. Amen. And not everyone will have to wait until the years of Abraham. <laughs> Thank you for repeating that. According to your situation, not everyone will have to wait that because God is merciful. Thank you. Thank you, Mother Saul. He's we, kind. We... Yes. And he knows. Thank you so much for that great point. I like the point that Sister Saul mentioned there. She referenced Saul. Did you catch that? Mother Saul is so good. She can skim a Bible reference and you just have to pick it up while she's moving. You remember, uh, not Saul, uh, David. Paul, um, who said, uh, three times I prayed to the Lord and, and uh, take this from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Uh, Sister Rose, let's not ignore our friends at home. Let's take our two or three thoughts from them before we go to David. Over in live stream, D says, waiting isn't about us. God is always on time and knows best. A strong we point. just need to believe. Follow all what he says and stay close to him. Alana says, we are administered to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. God wouldn't said, would have sent what we have asked for. However, we may have missed the opportunity 
because we need to heal from things that hold us back in progression. And over in YouTube, keep on trusting. He will make all things beautiful in his time. June says to wait is to trust in the Lord. Um, D, we must remember that if we have waited and it still does not come, what God has for you is for you. Therefore, it was not for you. Mildred says, I've been waiting for years and I haven't gotten what I am waiting for. However, I wait. And in waiting, I use my lemons to make lemonade. All right, I believe that God <laughs> is using me anyway my life leads, anywhere my life leads me. And Pat says, what I am hoping for may be not what God wants for me. Mm. Audrey says, wait again. He said, wait. I am still waiting. Mm. Um, Gless says, we have to believe that the Lord promised to supply all our needs and will give us what we can manage in all circumstances. And Charles says, what I don't, when I don't get my desire, it doesn't put God's existence into question, All right, now. but just the wisdom of my desire. What am I not learning is what then becomes my question. Um, True Angel's message says, if the promise is of man, then I consider it a lie. But if the promise is made by God, I am sure that even if I wait until death, Amen. he is able to restore my life because yes. God is faithful. And Curtis says, I continue to trust God and pray for grace with the understanding and the, fa and the fact that God knows what is best for me. Okay. Can I just do the last three? Go Ant ahead. Yes, Anthony absolutely. says, um, God knows best. When things don't come through, Based on our prayerful expectations, we accept that God's will is being expressed to us, whether he answers our prayers the way we de desire or not. Mm. And Sun Sun says, an Olympian does not do nothing and turn up at the Olympics. <laughs> they train and perfect their techniques in becoming Olympic. To the yeah. same goes for us. All right. So in other words, we just need to wait. No, um, no, I think, I, no, I think what some say is that you train. I Paul train. says, I discipline my body. Yes. That's when I preach, I become a castaway. Sun Sun is, is doing a serious Bible reference there. Go ahead, yes. let's hear this point. And um, the last one, Elaine says, I have to believe that he alone can see beyond the bend. All right. I think of a story I have heard of someone praying for their friend's conversion. Both came to God, but after his death. Mm. Wow. And the last one, Maxine says, Moses was waiting 40 years to go in the promised land, and God said no. <laughs> let's, let's bring a close to proceedings there. Um, you guys did exceedingly well. Thank you, friends at home, for being our at-home panelists. Here's a question to you at home. Which of the studies on Psalms, which of the lessons really stood out for you? Why? Which of the studies on Psalms, we're, doing, we're going to look back now. We have 13 lessons. Uh, we're, we're, today's the end of it. We have about 15 minutes remaining or so. And so I want you to uh, quickly tell me which of the studies on Psalms really stood out for you and why. Why don't we start with Sister Diane. Um, if we could just get the camera to Sister Diane. And Sister Diane, I want you to, to look at uh, lessons one, two, and three. Uh, lesson one, just briefly, um, tell us what the lesson was about, what stood out for you. Um, in just a minute, we, we don't need to be long. Just, just a refresher, if, if you will. Sure. So we have lesson one going back to the beginning. That was how to read the Psalms. Um, so within that, this, we have the lesson. Um, it just sort of pointed out uh, that Psalm is the prayer book and the hymn book throughout generations. Mm -hmm. um, it's been there. And um, of course, not originating for mortals um, who, had how, who have written it, but it is God alone. Um, that speaks through his servants right. um, involved in that book. And we also see as well that Jesus referred to the Psalms many a time. Um, you can look um, in your own time, uh, Mark 12, 10, and we have John 8, 13, sorry, verse 18. Fantastic. Um, Thank you for that on lesson number one. Lesson number one was an introduction, how to read the Psalms, yes. setting us up for what was to come. What about lesson two? Yes, and then in lesson two, um, uh, so this pointed out that um, God placed uh, the prayer book 
um, which is the Psalms in the heart of the Bible. Mm. Um, so that's not simply showing um, how the people within the Psalms how to pray, but us too today. Um, and then from earlier ages, the Psalms has shaped um, people's prayer lives as it has done with ours. I'm sure we can testify. Um, and if we look at, uh, so First Chronicles 16, 7 to 9, we see that that's taken from Psalms um, 105. And then we read Jesus um, as well when he was on the cross, Matthew 27, verse 46. He quoted himself um, as he is God. Um, that's from Psalms 22, verse 1. Great, great. Um, which was beautiful. And I liked just a, a small takeaway um, mm. just from Friday's lesson. Um, it just mentioned that when we pray and sing the Psalms, we assume the persistence, boldness and courage and hope of the psalmists. They encourage us to continue our spiritual journey and comfort us that we are not alone. Yes. Um, other people like us have gone through dark times and yet were triumphant by the grace of God. Fantastic. At the same time, the Psalms reveal to us the glimpses of Christ's fervent intercession on our behalf. Excellent stuff. Always. Just a reminder of friends at home, we're asking you to tell us which lesson stood out for you? Why did it stand out for you? Eh? If you could just send that in to us while we're, we're going. Dan, that was a masterful job. How about lesson three? Very briefly, what did lesson three have to say? Yes, so lesson three titled The Lord Reigns. Very, very powerful title. Um, so the lesson pointed out that the Psalms unswervingly upholds the foundation belief in God's sovereign reign. The Lord created, the Lord created, sustains everything that he has created as well. He is a sovereign king over the whole world. Um, uh, we had the memory text in uh, verse... Chapter Psalm 93, verse 1, sorry. Um, and then also just highlighting the magnitude and the, the greatness and the majesty of God. Mm. Um, there's also Psalm 8 as well and Psalm 100. Um, if we just uh, quickly go to, to Psalm 8, um, just uh, the, considering the fingers of mm -hmm. the I moon. Mean, sorry, let me just... No, that was a beautiful... I remember it. that lesson um, talking about the majesty and splendor of God. Psalm 8 had a lot to say. It's a, it's a very good point you, you make, Dan, but, but do go ahead. Yes. Um, so just Psalm 8, verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? So it's just it's just that really that greatness and that glory um, that's really coming out and, and that God alone is worthy to be worshipped uh, alone. Um, mm. So I thought that that was uh, really powerful. That was a very strong lesson. Elder Saul, um, Dan, that was a fantastic job. At home, what lesson really stood out for you? And, 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 and why? Uh, how about um, four, five, and six, Elder Johnny? What, 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 do you, what do you say? Starting with lesson four, the Lord hears and delivers. Mm -hmm. The memory verse for that week was Psalm 34, verse 17, and it said, the righteous cry out, and the Lord mm -hmm. hears and delivers mm -hmm. them out of their, all their troubles. A lot of the Psalms, there was the lamenting that, that, that uh, the, the psalmist expressed. But the question for those of us studying <clears throat> is like, what change is this going to make to our devotional life as we study these psalms? There was um, an assurance of God's care that came out in that lesson, yeah. um, bringing deliverance and, and being a refuge. Um, it featured a favorite psalm of many of us, Psalm 121, reminding us to lift up our eyes unto the hills from whence cometh our help. And that was the important takeaway for me from lesson number four. Mm. Shall I shoot on to number five, sir? Yes, indeed. Lesson number five was entitled Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land. The memory mm. verse taken from Psalm 137 verse four asked the question, how shall we sing a song in the strange land? Now, many psalms in the quarter, as I was saying earlier, featured this lamenting in the psalmist crying out to God for deliverance. And, and this also featured in lesson number five. Mm -hmm. And the question was asked, where is God? Going back to that point that Elder Neal was raising is that when you're in this crucible and you're, you're, you're waiting on the Lord for so many years, do you ask yourself this question, where is God? My takeaway for you from that lesson, be sure to learn the song of Moses and the Lamb and keep singing it everywhere you go. Just before lesson six, Johnny, that was a brilliant point. I do see some of our friends making some point. Sister Rose, give us some thoughts from our friends before we move on. Yes. Um, Three Angels Message says lesson of the past, which I think was lesson 10. Mm. Um, Erica says lesson four, the Lord my deliverer. Yes. Um, Andre says this final lesson stood out for me 
because it demonstrates the importance of waiting and trusting God. Good things come to those who wait. Mm. And I think um, Karen also agrees that this lesson is a lesson for her. Um, just as Elder Johnny was talking about lesson five, Carolyn puts in lesson five, singing the Lord's song in a strange land. Amidst everything going on around us, we can't forget how the Lord has led us in the past mm -hmm. and rejoice knowing that God will deliver his people. Yes. And, um, sorry, Pat says, um, this one is definitely for me because I am waiting to do a medical procedure and my faith and patience is being tested. Mm. And Erlin says, lesson eight, wisdom for righteous living. The next Psalm, the text Psalm 90, 12. Life is short, so we need to take stock of our life. And Good Anthony stuff. says, lesson 11, longing for God in Zion. Uh, when our one. faith transforms to sight, the re-experience in living in the light of God's divine presence now actualize. All right. And just, can yeah. I just do two more? Yes, All go, the lessons were great for me, but waiting on the Lord this week, and when we refer to our favorite Psalms. Mm -hmm. And lesson five, going through storms in life, the importance of being close to God no matter where we are. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much. Elder Johnny, lesson six. Briefly yes, remind number us what that was Number six was entitled, about. I Will Arise. The memory verse was Psalm 12, verse five. For the oppression of the poor, for the singing of the needy. Now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he, he years. Mm -hmm. year, years. Um, it reminded us that uh, God is our majestic warrior, warrior who will bring peace, who will bring justice, sorry, to the oppressed, especially uh, upon leaders who pervert the course of justice. Just a message for many to hold on today in these challenging and unfair times. Um, verses from Psalm 96, 99 and 132 reminded us of the importance of the heavenly sanctuary where our Lord dwells and will administer judgment. Remember. The evil one hoped mm -hmm. as Christ lay in the grave uh, that Christ would remain there. But mm -hmm. up from the grave he arose Amen. with a yeah. mighty triumph for the soul. Just as Christ rose up then, he will rise up for you. So keep trusting in him. Amen. Wonderful stuff, Elder Johnny, as always. Um, Elder David Billet, why don't you take us now to, I believe I gave you lessons seven, eight, and nine. Just a briefest of mentions about what, we, um, what those lessons had to say to us. Well, lesson seven certainly was something that resonated with me. Um, lesson seven, your mercy reaches unto the heavens. Uh, mm. It tells me that God's mercy isn't just something, it's not just a thought, it's something that engages with the very atmosphere of this world. Everything about this uh, creation that we live in is about God's mercy, his mm. love, the fact that we are careering through this mm. atmosphere uh, and, it, mm. uh, and, and there is this incredible... Uh, situation where there are there are natural devices protecting us and shielding us from all of the mm. cosmic rays and all of the things outside mm. tells me that God is in control. Um, the mercies of and, the Lord and, were not and, consumed. And, 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 and continually, yeah. yeah, continually, and regardless of who is on this planet, God's mercy is still there. The mercy mm. of God looks at, um, you know, when you look at that, that situation, you realize that the, the, you know, that, that looking at it from a salvational point of view, the blood of God, Christ, is a real entity that encircles this world, available for every single person Powerful that is point. out there. Powerful point. Um, lesson eight. Uh, lesson eight, we're looking at the, um, uh, thy word, looking at wisdom and righteous living. Uh, mm. It tells us that thy word I have in Psalm 119, verse 11, it tells us thy word have I hid mm. in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is the mindset of the psalmist. Mm. He does not, he wants to be in step with God. How many of us have been driving along, okay, in step with God, okay, listening to Adventist Radio or whatever we're listening to, um, and then someone does something stupid, and then somebody else jumps out of who you are, and you realize that you're still in this <laughs> wretched situation. Um, yeah. and, and, and therefore, only 
as you you know as i you know as as, as i as i begin to engage in driving 20 miles an hour um uh, to my frustration i actually realize that i've noticed more things and see more things than i ever had done slow before. down in life sometimes slow yeah. down life and when yeah. people whiz by me i just and, and do silly things i have enough time to engage and and, and just to pray to say, for them god bless you but anyway lesson that nine was, yeah yeah, lesson nine. Yeah. So looking at lesson nine, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this focuses upon Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We look at, for example, Psalm, Psalm 22 uh, and Psalm 22, where it tells us, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, the power and energy that, 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 that was thrust towards heaven. Mm. Um, but we forget that the Psalms were never written at, at chopped up. So immediately after that is Psalm 23, where, we can, where the reality steps in. Yes. Uh, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Mm. We can relax in the fact that he were the Lord. What is the Yahweh? Is, was, is Christ's shepherd, who is our shepherd, and mm -hmm. there's nothing that we need that he will not provide. Fantastic. David, you did a great job. Let me ask you a next question at home. You know I like to ask lots of questions to get us thinking. Your takeaway message from our study on the <laughs> Psalms. I just want your takeaway message. Either your takeaway message or what resonated with you throughout the whole quarter or what particular psalm stood out for you. Just give me something that hit you as we, we're going to leave the psalms behind now, or maybe you're seeing the psalm in a different light. Your reflections, your, your thoughts as we begin to leave the psalms behind now, move into great controversy and so on. Give me your thoughts, your takeaway message on the study on the psalms. Your favorite psalm may be, or maybe a new psalm became your favorite psalm, that sort of thing. That's what I want to hear from you. I'm going to come to you in just a moment. Lesson 10 was my lessons of the past. Really like lesson 10, because lesson 10 caused us to see our lives not just in isolation, but as part of whole. And, and, and they, there's, there are generations before us, and there are generations to come, quite possibly, should the good Lord tarry. What is your contribution? What is your psalm? What will you leave behind when, 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 uh, when your times come? I'm going to ask my camera friend just to, to go to Sister Jackie, because lesson 11 is a lesson, longing for God in Zion. That struck you, Jackie. Give us a brief summary and, and what stood out for you from lesson 11. Yes, um, this was an amazing lesson for me. The, the memory text, let's just read that. Psalms 84 verse 2. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Uh, honestly, I remember w when we did the lesson here, This I don't want this to be something I read. I want this to be my genuine experience. I, I want to, we, I remember we talked about being thirsty mm. and just that the, the, the only thing <coughs> that will quench your thirst is that water, that drink. And this scripture is saying, this is how we want to feel about God and being in his presence. We are, mm -hmm. we are thirsting, we are fainting, we are, you know, as the deer pants, we are panting for his presence and to be in his presence and to do his will. And I just really, really desire that to be the reality for me. And in order to do that, I have to be willfully mm -hmm. try to be in his presence, seek his presence, seek his face daily. It's not something that I can just lie down in bed. I'll just get up and quickly like in this week's Sabbath school lesson, it talked about, you know, the notes talked about just getting up and, and saying, Oh dear Lord, bless me. And off you go. You don't mm -hmm. spend any time with him. You just, you know, yeah. get in the car and just do a quick, we need to spend quality time in his presence yeah to have that feeling and to get to know how we can faint yeah. for him and only him. Well, oh, that's yeah. beautiful, Jackie. Thank you so much. Let me, before I go on with the other review, let's take some more thoughts from you. Uh, sis, uh, Sister, Sister Rose, I was about to call her Sister Saul. Okay. Um, someone says here that, um, sorry, Psalms 37 is my victory plan. <clears throat> sorry. Um, Charles was talking about lesson 11, lesson of the past, 
really help to put focus on the tension between mm. the young and the old yes. as far as passing on values mm. from one generation to the next. Very good point. So that was a good point from him. Um, other people were still commenting on their best lesson. That's right. uh, Maxine says, lesson six, God will take care of the poor <coughs> and needy. He is our deliverer and sustainer. Um, and Curtis says, lesson nine, blessed is who he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Psalms testify about Christ's person and ministry. Almost all aspects of his work in the in the plan of salvation are seen in the Psalms. Amen. And um, Jennifer says, lesson two, me asking God to teach me to pray because I didn't know how to. Mm. Um, and I'm still waiting for people to come through with their favorite Psalms. Okay, yes. So That's all right. Well, I'll come back to you. Yet. So I was simply saying that we're ending the Psalms now. What really stood out for you? What did you learn really overall? Um, Sabbath... Last week, worship that never ends was quite a powerful one. The memory verse there says to us, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Uh, that's quite fresh in the memory. And of course, today is about waiting on the Lord. Um, Elder Johnny, I'm going to ask you, what resonated with you throughout the whole quarter? It's a question I'll ask everyone, a question I've asked my friends at home. Uh, Mother Saul, I'm going to come to you in just a moment for your takeaway message from the from the uh, from the Psalms, Mother Saul. But Johnny, you go ahead. Um, something that stood out for you this this quarter. Many of us have read the Psalms, used the Psalms in devotions, and probably taken them in isolation or found a particular Psalm that deals with your circumstance at that particular time. But going through the Psalms in this way, I wasn't sure if the author was going to approach them chronologically, but the way they were grouped and recognizing mm, the Psalms, absolutely, mm. and recognizing, you know, a lot of Psalms refer to that time of uh, the, the, the children of Israel and, and, and coming out and they were thinking back. So that's the, that's the thing. It's remembering because even Psalm 126 verses 3 to 5, uh, I think it's verse 4, they're in captivity, but they are remembering. And this is the point that, you know, we need to make sure that we remember those good times. We, we learn when we're in the crucible so that it will help us as we journey through with the things that we deal with. So for me, it's recognizing the Psalms are more than just the devotional piece. Mm. They are actually things that are chronologically recording those experiences so that we can learn in the times that we're in. Fantastic stuff. We're going to go to Elder Billich in a moment. Mother Saul... What are you going to take away from the study on the Psalms, Mother Saul? What stood out for you? What resonated with you? As it is, within this, week, this week's lesson, I would like to keep centering my thoughts Hmm. Sorry, sorry, hmm. something fell for me. That's okay, Mother Saul. Yeah, you yes. were saying that this week's lesson on waiting was, was quite now, important. Psalm 71, Psalm 71, 1 mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that regardless of this situation, I must learn to trust my God. Mm. I must learn to allow his faith to grow in me because as I said before when God has given you his word we know he does not lie and he cannot lie so we have to learn to keep trusting him and the only way this can happen is by his grace his sustaining grace to keep us close to him so that our faith and our trust in him will be strong to go through the situation Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mother Saul. Elder Billet, the psalm that stood out for you or the lesson that came through for you as you reflect on the, the past quarter? Well, the psalms overall um, just remind me of an open door policy which God has. Um, it, as, uh, in Isaiah, although not a psalm, but it's like a psalm, it says that he dwells in a high and lofty place, uh, but he dwells also with him 
who is humble and contrite. In other words, that, that, that humility and that contrition uh, comes with a certain um, level of, of uh, or a lack of excitement. You're coming to God in peace. Um, and uh, the, the Psalms themselves actually meet every single need because they're written through human um, adversity and problems and difficulties and peace. Um, and regardless of what mood I'm in, how frustrated I might feel, for example, Psalm 35, and says, plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me, fight against them that fight against me. It's something, um, whilst this is not, for me, directed at specific human beings, it's di di directed at the enemy, mm. that God will fight my battles. And Jesus Christ is not just a you know, meek and mild character. He's there, armoured with the sword of righteousness and, and the, the, you know, the, the shield of, of faith and, and, and you know, the, the helmet of salvation and all of these things which come to mind as Christ fights my battles. Mm. And uh, I can rest in that reality. Mm. I can go to bed at night and sleep like Christ slept in the bottom of the boat um, while the storm was going on, knowing that my God has taken care of mm. every situation. Uh, Psalms, the Psalms have given you peace, David. Absolutely. Amen. Thank you so much. Sister Rose, let's take two more points from our friends. We only have two minutes to go. Let's be brief. Okay. Maxine says, I see the Psalms as a mini Bible. Everything is in it. Wow. My Psalm wow. is wow. 91. Wow. And Strong point. Erlene says, my family have a burden for years and I've been crying out to God for years. Mm. But Psalms 37 verses 1 to 7 gives me hope. So I am not giving up. He will answer my prayers, mm. for that's his promise. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, and, and there's another psalm that relates to what was just said there. Psalm 30, verse 5. For his anger lasts a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. What resonated with you, Diane, this quarter? What stood out for you? I think, as everyone has said, it's that opportunity um, that we can contemplate on the goodness of God um, throughout our personal lives. We can we can really see God um, in that way. And just within that, it's just finding that that rest in God that throughout every situation, as Elder David Billett has said, God covers us, um, that God is with us, that mm. that closeness of God, that personal, that God is a person, just so personal. Mm. And for me, that that really encouraged me and, and comforted me. Um, and uh, the, uh, Sister Jackie said earlier that we can see Christ um, within the Psalms, um, and just in that, it's, it's a beautiful picture. Amen. Um, and that really... We can see... I, I'll, I'll pick up on that point and end on that point. It's interesting that on the road to Emmaus in, chapter, in Luke, you remember that uh, when they were discouraged, he taught them from the Old Testament the things concerning himself. He, he, and the Psalms came through. Lesson 9 for me was a tour de force. It showed us the Messiah in the Psalms right across. Psalm 2, for example, verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And other Psalms, such as Psalm 89, um, and, he's, and um, he shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, also I'll make him my firstborn. And Hebrews went to town and that, and Acts went to town. And the way, never forget lesson nine. Lesson nine is crucial to our faith because it shows you Christ all over the Psalms. And that, I believe, was beautiful. My favorite Psalm, Psalm 100. It is he that has made us, not we ourselves. All we need to do is enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth will always endure to all generations. Thank you so much. Brand new people next week, brand new lessons next week. It has been a great joy. Sister Linda, we see your prayer request. We will be praying for all the prayer requests a bit later. Let's just bow our heads. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your people who have gathered here to study. Thank you for your words. May these words you reside in us and animate us to trust you more and live for you. Lord, the requests have come through. You have seen them. Meet each person at the point of their need. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless them and bless us as we go to our various churches and so on. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you so much. Thank you for your time.
Happy Sabbath, church. I'd like to welcome you all to Cradle and Seventh-day Advent- Seventh Adventist Church this morning. We'd like to thank those joining us in person and those online. We thank you for choosing Cradle to worship today. Um, we have several announcements that we'd like to bring to your attention. The teens department would like to launch an exam drop-in to support our teens. We'd love the support of teachers, tutors, or university students. If you would like to volunteer your time, please meet in the cabin 15 minutes after the divine service for more details on supporting our teens during their exams. Our practical Christian victory Bible study has been postponed for today. The study will resume on Sabbath, Saturday the 6th of April, when we'll cover the topic, the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God. Join us for our weekly Wednesday night prayer meetings at 12 p.m. on Zoom and 7.30 p.m. in person. We'll start a new series exploring the parables of Jesus. This Wednesday, we'll look at the parable of the sower. The Sabbath School team would like to invite you all back this afternoon at 5 p.m. for a, a reflection on the Psalms. It will be an evening of poetry, songs, and a play entitled The Emotion of the Psalms. Our business meeting will be held this afternoon at 6.30 p.m. We'll be presenting the church budget to our members. Our free mentoring training will also be delivered on Sabbath, Saturday the 6th of April from 5 to 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. The course is designed to nurture, strengthen, and help you grow spiritually as you develop the skills to mentor adults, our youth, and young people. You can register for this training by completing the form on the church website. Don't miss your chance to build this sought after skill for free. And just a reminder that the clocks will go forward by one hour this Sunday night. Please visit the events section of the church website for information about most of the events at Croydon Church. That's the end of my announcements. Thank you for listening and have a blessed Sabbath. Happy Sabbath Church. This is the second reading from the board meeting that was held on the 17th of March for membership transfers, and I'll be reading the names twice. So we have two uh, individuals who are transferring in. They are Stella Romain from the Lewisham SDA Church to the Croydon SDA Church, and Joseph Romain from the Emmanuel SDA Church to Croydon SDA Church. So that's Stella Romain from the Lewisham Church, and Joseph Romain from the Emmanuel Church. And you've seen the pictures on the screen. So I'm and they are here with us today as well, so we just asked them if they could stand. So you can be seen. Just like you to see them in person as well as in the pictorial form. So as part of this process, I move. Maybe you could stand on the door. Just turn around. I move that these names be accepted into the Croydon SCA Church. Accepted. Is there a second to that? Okay, all in favor? Those opposed? Well, you have seen for yourself. Um, so we'd just like to welcome you into the fellowship of the Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church. At the end of the service, I guess, uh, you can come forward and the folks would like to greet you and welcome you to the church. God bless you. Okay. We also have um, an additional announcement. Um, You would have remembered Brother Simon Edwards, who worshipped here. His funeral will be held at the Brixton Church on the 16th of April at 10 a.m. Brother Simon Edwards. His funeral will be held at the Brixton Church, uh, St. Lee Street, we know it well, on the 16th of April at 10 a.m. in the morning. 
Also, on Thursday, we had a funeral um, of Brother Richard Abraham, his wife, uh, Sister Vadney, and um, his sister, um, Francis, would like to thank the church in a very special way for the prayers and support uh, that has been given to the family during this time. And I know the church did come out on Thursday to support the family at the funeral. And so, uh, may God bless you. Thank you. Happy Sabbath Church, can you please stand as we sing Into My Heart? Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Let us pray. Lord, we just want to thank you that this is your Sabbath day and thank you that we can be in your temple courts to praise your name. We invite your Holy Spirit's presence to be with us, that our worship and our prayers and our praise will be acceptable in thy sight. For Jesus' sake, amen. Happy Sabbath, Church. For today's praise and worship, the first song we're singing is He is Exalted.
The next song you'll sing is Lord, I Lift Your Name On High. Salvation to 
Praise God, church. Amen, amen. Thank you for the beautiful singing. Just what we need right now. A blessed Sabbath greetings to you. What we're going to do now is invite everyone here and those worshipping with us online to join us in approaching the King of Kings in prayer. And as we prepare ourselves with reverent positions, you can kneel where possible. And with reverent hearts, the start of Psalm 136 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. Let's pray. Almighty God, your people are gathered together in your name, acknowledging you, the Lord God, the creator of heaven and earth, on this your holy Sabbath day. We reverence you and give you glory as we, your creation, approach you, our God, the only one worthy of our worship, our praise, our highest affection. So we join with the heavenly courts above continually praising in their purity and perfection and say, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Yet while you are the one who set the planets and galaxies in the midst of space, the earth spinning among them, you condescend to shower us with your love. That is a great wonder beyond our comprehension. If we ever doubt your love for us and desire to provide for our needs, help us remember your sacrifice on the cross for us. We are not worthy, but we thank you and we praise you. We come with grateful love. We come with total dependence. Where we have fallen short of your glory, as we frequently do, we ask you to forgive us and change us to be more like you as we offer your prayer, giving this prayer to you, giving thanks that your death on the cross has covered us all and covered it all. The word says about you that those who come to him must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. On that promise, where so many people are experiencing bereavement at this time, you are love. Comfort them and shower them with your grace and mercy. Those in any kind of need, financial or otherwise, you are the provider. Help them, we pray. Those experiencing health problems and ailments related to old age, we pray for you to cover them with your healing balm. Those of us experiencing things we feel we cannot talk about, Hear our pleas, even when silent, and relieve us. For those experiencing struggles, secret sins, relational challenges, or spiritual battles, deliver them, spring any traps of the enemy, and overturn them in Jesus' name, and restore all things. We know that prayer for the Holy Spirit of God is our most urgent need at this time. So according to the promise, we come as hungry children, knowing that you are more willing for us to be filled with your presence than earthly parents are to give their own children food. You are the answer to all our problems. Cleanse us, baptize us anew, convict us, unite us, give us fruitful characters like yours and fruitful service. Consume us and our self-interest. Transform us, fill us. Give us a fresh revelation of you, Spirit of God, as you move in our midst. We need to see you, Lord Jesus Christ, rule and reign in our homes, in our hearts, in our churches and streets. 
O oh Lord, and give us a compassion for others that leads the, us to desire to go about doing good. And may your spirit cause us to make room for you so you can work in ways beyond our dreams. Impart love for you, our Father, and for our fellow human beings. As we dwell upon you in beholding we are changed into your image, burn your image into our hearts, we pray. And may your blessing rest upon your servant, Pastor Blake, now ministering here. In his goings and comings, in all he does, lift up the light of your countenance upon him. Your all-sufficient grace and peace give him, we pray. Magnify your character and gifts within him. Be his inspiration, protection. Grant him fresh supplies of anointing from your Holy Spirit and fresh words from your own presence like manna and morning dew as he delivers a word for us from you today. What an awesome honor prayer is, a connection with God, a bridge to heaven. As we close, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of prayer, but may we remain in your presence, encouraged by the words you said to those who approached you, Lord Jesus, when you were on earth. By faith, we go in peace, knowing that in your perfection, you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we may ask or imagine. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. This is a special moment in the life of Carl and Dominic Hazley. They have brought little Eli to be dedicated. Could you just uh, come forward? And I know they have other families uh, here to support them. Uh, the When we're doing the vows, we'll ask the family to stand at, not at this point in time, when we're doing the vows, we'll ask them to stand uh, with you. It's a privilege to, and a blessing to have a child. I believe every woman looks forward for the time when they can cradle their own child. Not everybody is blessed in this direction, and so, and after that, when you're blessed, but we give thanks to God for safe delivery, because so many things happened. And so you are here today to ask God's blessing on little Eli. We know that the name Eli, he was a faithful servant of God. You know, with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we do not practice infant baptism. There's just some things you just need to make it so that those who are watching online, the parents are the persons who are dedicated because little Eli does not really know what's happening here today. And so the parents who receive the instruction and the parents answer the vows. And so a blessing. So you are dedicated to this task 
of parenthood and a blessing is asked on the life and the journey of little Eli. Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 18, verse 16, suffer a lot of little children to come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus Christ was referring here to the, the nature of children and asking us adults to be, have the nature because children are so loving and forgiving and you know, um, a child does something wrong and you push them away, they, they'll be back next to you, you know, in a second. But adults, we keep our distance. They're so loving and caring and, and understanding. Now, dedication is an act whereby someone or something is set apart for holy use. As parents, you know, we're living in a difficult age. In our world, there's a battle for the minds. And so you're up against the television and the, the media and the social systems and even legislation. These are some of the challenges that you have. But nevertheless, uh, little Eli is, is your responsibility. He did not ask to be here in love and mercy and grace. You have brought him forth through the help of God. Now, where do you stand in all of this? Because it's not easy. Parenting is not for the faint-hearted. You know, sometimes you, you travel behind cars and you see a dog is not for Christmas, but for life. And so when you think about the life that God has given to you, well, it's an eternal, more or less, responsibility that God has given to you. And so you're here because you want to solicit God's help in the upbringing of your child, little Eli. It's a very serious responsibility. Your home is first school and first church. All the values, everything that will be instilled in, in, in Little Eli will come from you and the examples that you set. And so you have to be careful what you say and what you do because whatever the, the, uh, Eli sees and whatever he goes and somebody asks the question, well, mommy and daddy does it. Huh? And so I'm doing it. And so you have to be careful in terms of, you know. You know, we live in a world, in a climate whereby sometimes you hear people in the media, it's the school's responsibility. It's the police responsibility. No, it's your responsibility. It's your divine responsibility that God has placed on you. Remember, it says in Proverbs 22, 26, train up a child in the way they should go so when they're old, they will not depart. It's God's best gift that he's given to you, a child. You know, people spend money, thousands and thousands of pounds, flying all over the place just to give birth, to conceive, to get a child. And here God has blessed you uh, with a little Eli. And so we live in an evil age. There are other vices. And sometimes when you listen to the report, what's going on, the abuse up to during the week that is meted out to children. Mm. And so your responsibility uh, is serious. And so it will come out in terms of the vows that you will answer uh, before uh, the congregation here in terms of your responsibility to God. And we pray that God will give you the help, God will give you the strength, God will provide the means, all that is necessary to enhance the life of little Eli. And you have your little um, daughter here. Yara. Yara. Yara is here also to witness yeah. this great event. And so we pray that God will bless you. We have some very uh, important vows um, for you to answer. And if you can answer, I think you may need a mic because um, the congregation will want to hear you answer. And so if you have a mic, and so if you can say, we will or we do what suits you. Um, that will be good, and then the prayer will be offered. And so if I can just ask the supporting family if you can stand at this time. Um, yes, I know Jonathan is standing already, and uh, <laughs> Ivan, uh, who is here to uh, support the family at this, this time. Um, will you enter into a covenant relationship with God in the upbringing of little Eli? We will. 
We will. We will. Did you hear it back? We I don't will. think they heard. We will. Okay. Will you accept the responsibility of true parenthood and all that it entails as it relates to the upbringing of little Eli? We will. Do you promise to provide, to protect, to care for, to nurture and educate little Eli? We will. Do you promise to create a safe shelter and homely environment, not entertaining bad influences and indulging in and allowing any abuses that may harm little Eli? We will. In times of sickness or need, when you may have to sacrifice of your time and means, do you plan to be there for little Eli? We, we will. Do you plan to raise little Eli in the fear and knowledge of God, to instill Christian values to him about nature, about life and God's words, so that one day little Eli may make a decision to accept Jesus Christ? We, we will. And to the church family, uh, this is your time. Do you promise to assist these parents and little Eli in whatever way you can to enhance his livelihood and spiritual growth? We will. Praise God. And so you have answered before God in this congregation, saying we will to every question. Please be aware that God expects you to honor all your divine responsibilities to which you have answered. Okay, I just want to ask the congregation to bow their heads as the family remains standing, um, and Elder Patrick will do the prayer of dedication, of blessing. Now, we, we agreed that you would hold <laughs> Eli. Yeah, so, no, so you can continue to hold him, Carl. Thank, thank you very much. Let us pray. The Bible says, They brought unto him also infants, that he would bless them. Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Father, by thy grace, we pray that Carl and Dominic would do their best to fulfill their task as parents. We all promise and covenant to love and support this family as they raise Eli and their little daughter, Yara, to fulfill God's destiny and purpose for their lives. Father, we have witnessed the dedication of the parents of Eli and the promises made of Carl and Dominic, family and friends. We pray for your grace on them to fulfill their promises and vows. We ask you, Lord, to bless Eli and pray that he grows up to love and to follow you, Lord, and to give you all the honor and glory as you help him to choose his friends Grant him a strong, healthy mind and body to know you and to follow your lead in his life. And as he grows, Lord, we pray that his parents and the villagers, we all, will help him to develop a lasting relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for your protection, provision, and blessing upon Eli and his family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's present the certificate. Now we're going to present the certificate to, to you both. It's a certificate of dedication of, of Eli on this day. And it says that um, his birth was on the 19th of September 2022 at King's College Hospital. He was presented to the Lord in dedication on the 30th day of March, 2024. And also he enrolled in the Cradle Roll Sabbath School of Croydon Seventh Adventist Church. So we're gonna present this to you and uh, it will be placed in his bedroom, <laughs> which he will never, never forget this day. So thank you so much.
In Matthew chapter 25, we are told of a parable of talents. Something's happening here that's making me help. We have that right at the beginning again, please. I don't know how it's whizzing through like that, on its own accord. But anyway, we're told of a parable of talents. Most of you here, I am sure, will know that parable. And for those of you who may not be aware of it, I shall be briefly going through it with you. A man went on a far journey, and he had three servants. He gave them a different amount of talents based on their ability. To one he gave five, to one he gave two, and to the other he gave one talent. Now, the one he gave five talents to, I'm going to ask you to move this forwards, please, because this zapper doesn't seem to be working. The one he gave five talents to yielded five more, doubled his investment, made ten. The one he gave two talents to doubled it and made four. And the one he gave one talent to said, I don't think this is too much, I can't do much with it, so he buried it in the ground. And when the person came back, he said to his servants, right, I'm glad with you who's made five more, I'm glad with you who've made two more, I think that the one who I gave one to could have done something with it, you are wicked and slothful. What's that got to do with us? Could I invite the deacons to come forward to collect our tithes and offerings? Giving to Croydon is quick and easy, and we have provided six safe and secure ways to do this. In person, with an offering envelope. Online, through our website, where you also have the option to automate your giving using PayPal, balance transfer, directly into the church account. There is also the option to use the Mobi Cash app, you can donate via text or phone the South England Conference Office. The details are on your screen or can be found at croydonadventist.org forward slash give. The heart of Croydon is expressed in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 7. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Thank you for your continued support of Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, we've heard about the gift of the talents and what the different servants did or did not do with the money. Now, what is the application for us today? Those who are the one talent people, you might think, okay, I return my tithes and I give a free will offering. I'm doing the right thing. But, I'm going to put it to you today that you might be considered as one of the one talent people. Notice I said might be. And you think, hang on a minute, I am being faithful in what I am doing. If we can move the slides forwards, please. The average earnings in the UK as of January this year was £35,000. Now, if we look at Mr. and Mrs. average, they say that they were earning £36,000. That's about average, isn't it? What's a thousand pound between friends? So, Mrs. Average, or Mr. Average, earned 36,000 pounds, which is 3,000 pounds a month. So from his money, he returns his 300 pounds tithe, and that is 10% or one tenth of his, of his, of his um, earnings. Now, 
he also gives a £150 offering. In total, it's £450. Now, he's seen as being faithful because he's done what he's needed to do. But when we consider what is the difference in a two-talent person, someone who yields an increase, we have Mrs. Average. Mrs. Average earns the same amount as Mr. Average, £36,000. She returns her £3,000. Uh, she returns her £300, one-tenth, for her tithe and gives a £150 offering as well. But whereas Mr. Average, his £450 is a total, hers is a sub total because she is a part of the gift aid scheme. The gift aid scheme enables one to claim back the tax that they've already paid on that money that they've put in to their tithes and offerings because the church is seen as a charity. So in addition to the £450 that Mrs. Average gives in a month, the tax claimed back is £112.50. She's still putting in the same amount as her husband, but the church is getting back that £112.50 because she is on the gift aid. So, in total for the month, the church has gained £562.50 for the money, for the money that she's given. You think about it, for one month, £112.50, for the year, that's £1,350 extra that the church can benefit. So, if there are any of you who are taxpayers here, and you're not on the gift aid, please see me or one of the treasurers, because you need to be on the gift aid. Because if you see the amount of money, additionally, that the church can benefit from by you just returning what you do return now. And the even better news is that if you don't think you've been as good a steward as you could have been, you can reclaim for the last four years, and the church can benefit from whatever you have given in the last four years. So think about that, and please take it seriously. Come and see me if you do need to know any more about this. Let's stand, please. Father God, we thank you so much for the gift of giving. We also thank you that out of the 100 that you have given us, you only ask us to return 10 to you. And Lord, we still have the 90. I pray that we'll make good use of what you have left us with. Be willing to free will give as well, not just for only the cause of the church, but to others as well. And may we be wise stewards and consider the gift aid program if we are working and earning tax on the money that we're earning so that your church can benefit from more resources to do more with. And pray these things in Jesus' name. Thank you again for the offerings. Amen.
I just want to say good afternoon, family, to the church family, and to the international family that's watching online. I'm sure you did enjoy that song. Jesus is a God of miracles, and he can do the impossible. When you see young children in the church, you know that the church has a future. And if the Lord tarries, they will be taking your place because we will be dead and gone. <laughs> so uh, let's continue to pray for them, and support them, and encourage them as they are trained in the fear and knowledge of God in the church. Just thank God for all the teachers um, that have been training um, the children. It takes a lot of time. And we just want to congratulate our teachers and behoves us also. I just want to put a little plug for parents to please bring their children on time to Sabbath school because the teachers are here waiting. Isn't that so? They're waiting. And so may God bless you. This week or weekend is the most important weekend generally in the Christian calendar. Uh, sometimes we call it Holy Week and what have you and different names, Holy Thursday and, you know, it's the Easter weekend. It's celebrated between March, the 22nd of March and the 25th of April. Of course, it depends on the moon. And that's, sometimes it comes in March and sometimes it comes in April. It's a Christian celebration of the resurrection of Christ. The servant of the Lord to the remnant church admonishes that as Christians, 
we shall daily humble our hearts before God. And at the foot of the cross, we shall have distinct views of the loveliness of Christ. Taken from Review and Herald, December 1890, paragraph 15. In other words, um, Ellen White is saying that we need to go there daily to the cross and consider what Christ has accomplished for each and every one of us. After hearing the words of scripture from Matthew 20:28, 20, a blind woman, Fanny Jane Crosby, after hearing the words of scripture in Matthew 20:28, 20, just as the son I quote, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. She was impressed to write the words of this beautiful hymn that we know well, tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word, tell me the story most precious, sweeter than ever was heard in the last verse. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. And so she wrote that song because it was a summary of Jesus' earthly life, his birth, his temptation, his ministry, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. And so today as a church and those who are watching online, we want to reflect on that story and it comes in what we call a narrational cantata, narration and hymn in which we all will be a part of that story. The Jewish establishment was upset with Jesus' teaching, his life and ministry. He was seen as irregular, contrary to the rules. He was called a rabbi, but he had not entered by the correct door or climbed up by the right ladder. He had no credentials, no proper authorization. He had courted controversy by his provocative behavior, fraternizing with disreputable people, feasting instead of fasting, and profaning the Sabbath by healing people on the Sabbath. Not content with disregarding the tradition of the elders, he had actually rejected them wholesale and criticized the Pharisees for exalting tradition above scripture. He said that they care more for regulations than for persons, more for ceremonial cleansing than for moral purity, more for laws than for love. He condemned their lifestyle. He announced them as hypocrites, called them blind leaders of the blind, and likened them to whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones. They were, these were intolerable accusations. They felt he was undermining their authority. He was making outrageous claims to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He claimed to know God uniquely as his father, even to be equal with God. It was blasphemy. Yes, it was blasphemy. His doctrine was heretical. His behavior was a front to the sacred law. He was leading the people astray. And there were rumors that he was encouraging disloyalty to Caesar. And so his ministry must be stopped before he did any future further damage. And these reasons were good enough to arrest him, put him on trial, and silence him for good. 158, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Okay, 
church, let's sing together. claimed authority to teach about God, to drive out the demons, to forgive sins, to judge the world. There was a self-evident genuineness about his authority that they could not handle. It was real, effortless, transparent from God. They felt threatened by Jesus. They said he was undermining their prestige, their hold over the people, their own self-confidence and self-respect while leaving his intact. They were envious of him and therefore determined to get rid of him. It was sheer envy which led them to hand over Jesus. At the beginning of his life, Herod the Great tried to kill him. At the end of his ministry, the priests handed him over. As a matter of fact, he came to his own and did not, they did not receive him. They gave up their own to be killed by a foreign forces, by the Romans. Sadly, we too want to get rid of him, some of us. We resent his intrusion into our lives, our business, our privacy. We abhor his demand for our homage. We resist his expectation for our obedience. We ask, why can't he mind his own business? We ask petulantly to leave us alone so we to perceive him as a threatening rival who disturbs our peace, ups upsets our status quo, undermines our authority and diminishes our self-respect. Get rid of him. That's the cry of the world when I survey the wondrous cross.
When the Jewish leaders brought Jesus to Pilate, they said, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. As his investigation proceeded, Pilate was convinced of Jesus' innocence. He was obviously impressed by Jesus' noble bearing and his self-control and political harmlessness. Three times he declared publicly he found no fault for charging him. Neither has Herod. He had done nothing to deserve death. On hearing this, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate's wife had sent him, sent him a message about Jesus, Jesus' innocence. Have nothing to do with this innocent man. But he wanted to avoid sentencing Jesus. He wanted to sit on the fence, neither here nor there. He wanted to release Jesus and also at the same time pacify the Jews. And so he sent him to Herod. Let Herod make the decision. But Herod sent him back to Pilate. And so he tried half measures. I will have Jesus punished, then release him. He hoped this would satisfy the crowd. But he had initially said Jesus was innocent. So Jesus should be released and not flogged. He tried to do the right thing for the wrong reason. And so Pilate tried to protect his innocence. He took water and washed his hands before the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood. But before his hands were dry, he had handed Jesus over to be crucified. How could he bring himself to incur this guilt, this great guilt, immediately after proclaiming Jesus' innocence. 412, look upon Jesus. Covered with his life, 
whiter than snow, fullness of his life, then shall I know my life of scarlet, my sin and woe, covered with his life, whiter than snow. Praise the Lord. Yes, it's easy to condemn Pilate I overlook our own equally devious behavior at times. We too are anxious to avoid the pain of a wholehearted commitment to Christ. We too search for convenience, evasion, or excuse. We either leave the decision to somebody else, decline or opt out for half-hearted compromises, or even make a public affirmation of loyalty while at the same time denying him in our hearts. The shouts of the crowd prevailed. Pilate granted their demand. He surrendered Jesus to their will. Yes, he wanted to release Jesus, but he wanted to satisfy the crowd. There are flaws in the Jewish leader's case, where the leaders were the leaders concerned about political stability, doctrinal purity, doctrinal truth and moral purity? No. Pilate did not think so. He detected under their disguise their vulgar vice of envy. Pilate was a shrewd judge of human character. It is endorsed in Matthew's words. I quote, he knew it was out of envy that they handed Jesus over. Envy, envy, envy is the reverse side of a coin called vanity. Nobody is ever envious of others who is not first proud of himself or herself. And the Jewish leaders were proud. Proud of their nation's long history. Proud of their relationship with God. Proud of their authority. Their contests with Jesus it was an authority struggle for we challenge their authority. The painful part is that Jesus possessed in himself an authority which they manifestly lacked. And so the old Negro spiritual asks, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yes, we were there. Not as spectators only, but as participants, plotting, scheming, betraying, bargaining, and handing him over. And so we washed our hands in innocence. 159 on a hill far away.
Why did he die? Why did he die? Horatius Bonar, the Prince of Scottish Hymnwriters, expressed in words of song, does I that shed the sacred blood, I nailed him to the tree, I crucified the Christ of God, I joined the mockery of all that shouting multitude, I feel that I am one. And in that din of voices rude, I recognize my own. Around the cross, the trunk I see, mocking, mocking the sufferer's groan. Yet still my voice, it seems to be, as if I mocked alone. Why did he die? He died to do his father's will. He did not spare his son. He died for human sin. He did not die as a martyr. On the contrary, he went to the cross voluntarily and even deliberately. From the beginning of his public ministry, he consecrated himself to his destiny. In his baptism, he identified himself with sinners as he was to do fully on the cross. In his temptation, he refused to be deflected from the way of the cross. He repeatedly predicted his sufferings and death and set himself to go to Jerusalem to die there. The good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. He said, I lay down my life and no one takes it from me. Octavius Wilson asks, who delivered Jesus to die? Not Judas for money, not Pilate for fear, not the Jews for envy, but the father of love. He spared not his own son. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 317, King of my life. human level. Judas gave him up to the priests, who gave him up to Pilate, who gave him up to the soldiers, who crucified him. But on a divine level, the Father gave him up, and he gave himself up to die for us. As we face the cross, 
we can say, I did it. My sins sent him there. And he did it. His love took him there. Peter said, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. The universal symbol of the Christian faith is not a crib or a manger, but a gruesome cross. Yet many people are unclear about its meaning and cannot understand why Christ had to die. He died for us. His death secured eternal life for us. He's a good shepherd. He laid down his life for his sheep. He died that he might bring us back to God. His death brought salvation. We can only have peace with God through Jesus Christ because God accepts only Jesus. He died for our sins. Our sins were the obstacle preventing us from receiving the gift of salvation. So our sins had to be removed before salvation could be bestowed. And so he took our sins away by his death. And then he died our death. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. But Jesus, God's son, took our place. His death and our sins are linked. He was the victim of our human brutality. He endured in his innocence the penalty, the penalty our sins deserved. Chief of sinners, do I be? Jesus shed his blood for me. Christ arose from the dead as the first fruits of those that sleep. His resurrection took place on the very day when the wave sheaf was to be presented before the Lord. The sheaf dedicated to God represented the harvest. So Christ, the first fruits, represented the great spiritual harvest to be gathered for the kingdom of God. His resurrection is a type and pledge of the resurrection of all the righteous dead. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And to the believer, Christ is a resurrection and a life in our Savior, the life that was lost through sin, thank God, is restored. The life that Jesus laid down in humanity, he takes up again and gives to humanity. He said in John 10, 10, we know it well, I'm come that they may have life 
and that they may have it more abundantly. And so to the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. And closing, the voice that cried from that cross, it is finished, was heard among the dead. It pierced the walls of sepulchres and summoned the sleepers to arise. So it will be when the voice of Christ shall be heard from heaven. That voice will penetrate the graves and unbar the tombs. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. That same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise this church and glorify it with him. Above all principalities, above all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come, our Lord, our God, our Savior will come. For Hebrews 10, 37 says, for yet a little while, he that will come, will come, and will not tarry. Even so, come. Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Saints, can we please stand as we sing our closing hymn, Watch Ye Saints with Eyelids Waking. And let's remember, we are looking for our Lord to return. So when he goes low, we comes. I want you to raise the roof. Jesus comes. Lord. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to him who can keep you from falling and bring you safe to his glorious presence, innocent and happy. To God, the only God, who saves us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be the glory, majesty, authority, and power which he had before time began, now and forevermore, and all God's people say, Amen.